the room, everybody tuning in online, Porch Austin, Porch Boise, Porch Tulsa, Porch North Houston, Porch Scottsdale, all the different Porch Live locations. We're continuing this series on God, where we are looking at stories from the book of Daniel. Let me start by uh, giving a little vision into my world. In December, my wife and I moved our two oldest kids, our son and daughter, into the same room, put them in a bunk bed. Here's a picture of them, just chilling, loving life. Can't believe we get to sleep together. Got my princess cup and everything. And it was awesome. We combined bedtimes, which allowed you to put them both down at the same time. But shortly after uh, they began staying in the same room, my son, the boy on top, started having what's called night terrors. Now, just a heads up, someday you may have kids. This is not a nightmare. This is a night terror. What's the difference? Night terror happens about 45 minutes after you go to bed. Nightmare happens sometime in the middle of the night. I don't know. I don't make this stuff up. But anyways, he begins to have these night terrors, and we begin to try to figure out what's happening, like a night terror where he would just wake up, and it's not like just a nightmare where you wake up and you're, <gasps> it, you're like still in the sleep mode. So he's screaming, which means he's waking up his sister every single night, just some form of torture, 45 minutes into falling asleep. And my wife and I began to go, what, what is causing this? Is it something he ate? Is it because at first we thought it was, you know, we watched The Lion King. I knew I should have fast forwarded on the part with Scar and he's having night terrors now. And then eventually we began to go, man, is it something he's eating? Is it the time? Maybe we should wake him up 45 minutes in and then that'll avoid it. Nope. It just delayed the night terror from happening. So we began to just look for solutions. We're trying essential oils and rubbing it on things and just, you know, that's, that's who we are. And eventually, <laughs> my wife took him to the dentist and he was having his first dental appointment or one of his first dental appointments. And the dentist looked in his mouth and said, his tonsils are really large. Is he having night terrors? And it turns out that if you have you know, tonsils that are large at night, it can inhibit your breathing, which for whatever reason has some impact and creates night terrors. And so today, now he goes to bed and he has like this nasal saline spray that he has to put in there every single time that he goes to bed. But it gave him some relief. Now, what does that have to do with what we're gonna talk about tonight? We're gonna look at a man who is having a night terror, if you will, and it's a king named Nebuchadnezzar that we launched into last week. And Nebuchadnezzar begins to have this nightmare, this thing that is reoccurring and keeps him from being able to sleep. And Daniel, who's the focal point really of tonight and for much of the study on, on God, is going to interpret the dream. And the interpretation of the dream provides the relief the king was looking for. But in Daniel's interpretation and even the way that he goes before the king and communicates the meaning of his dream, we learn a lot of things that we're just gonna walk through and observe. One of the things that we learn is how Daniel could be so confident standing before the king. And so we're gonna explore and continue this series and learn what was at the root and behind why Daniel was so confident in the chaos. As we said last week, on God is looking at the book of Daniel. What's the book of Daniel? It's a book that was written 600 years ago in a town or in this capital city of Babylon. Babylonian Empire was the world superpower in 600 BC. It had conquered the known world and it was ruled by a ruthless dictator named Nebuchadnezzar. Here's a picture of the map of Babylon. No, that's Zac Efron. And uh, <laughs> there's Babylon. We, we just have pictures of Zac Efron around. There's Babylon. And you can see that's the Babylonian Empire. And the reason they had Zac Efron is whenever I read through Scripture, I'll think of the different characters that are involved. And so when I think of Daniel, like I said last week, I think of Zac Efron. When I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we think of the Spider-Man trio. When I think of King Nebuchadnezzar, this kind of evil king, I think either Jafar or the king from Gladiator. But those are kind of the characters. And Nebuchadnezzar rules the known world. He's taken captive Daniel and his friends. And Daniel is put to work in the king's palace. And the king's gonna have a dream, and Daniel's interaction and exchange and interpretation of the dream gives us a look into how he was so confident. And it also tells us the entire story of history. 
He tells a dream that, candidly, I don't know that I'll be able to put into words the power that this chapter has had since it was written. Because Daniel is going to say to the king, the events that happened immediately in the centuries following and that will happen all the way up until the Messiah's return. So we're going to be in Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 1. We're going to walk through three observations. If you have a Bible, you can flip there now. If not, it'll be on the screen. And as always, we have Bibles in the Welcome Center that are our gift to you. So let me start in verse 1. One night, during the second year of his reign, King Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams, he could not sleep. So he called his Magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers, anyone who had access to the divine. And he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I've had a dream that deeply troubles me. I must know what it means. The astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, long live the king. Tell us the dream and we will tell you what it means. But the king said to them, I am serious. If you don't tell me what my dream was, And what it means, I will have you torn limb from limb, and your houses turned into heaps of rubble. That escalated quickly. Nebuchadnezzar was known to have a temper, so he calls in his guys to say, I've had a dream, and I want you to tell me what it was and what it means. Some people believe it's because, like often happens when you have a dream, you wake up and you're like, wait, what was that? And was she there? And you can vaguely remember it, and you're like, I don't think he had pants on. And, you know, it's just kind of you're piecing together. Maybe it was that, or maybe... He just wanted to see if these men actually possessed the divine wisdom they claimed to. And the men say back to him, hey, nobody can do what you're asking. That's impossible. In verse 10, no one on earth can tell a king his dream. No king has ever asked of any person such a thing. The king's demand, verse 11, is impossible. He can't tell you your dream. No one except the gods can tell you your dream. And they do not live here among people. The king was furious, and he ordered all the wise men to be executed, which included Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When Arioch, the king's commander, came to kill them, that's a bad day, I'm here to kill you, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion, and he asked Arioch, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? Arioch explained everything that happened. Daniel went to see the king. He asked for more time to tell the king what the dream meant. And then Daniel went home, and he told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling him the secret so they would not be executed executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. The first thing I want to point out that we see from Nebuchadnezzar and his reason why Daniel had such confidence before the king is he knew what, Dan, or what Nebuchadnezzar's life reflects, everyone needs God. The king Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful person who had ever ruled to that point. He had created a civilization. Even his own palace and the city of Babylon was constructed in a way that he constantly lived in security. I mean, it was a marvel. The city itself was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It had walls 75 feet high and thick enough for two four-horse chariots to ride across. A Greek historian tells us that it was a marvel. He lived in luxury. He lived in security. He had more gold. One historian said Babylon contained more gold than dust. That he was the wealthiest, richest, securest. He had everything you'd want, and yet he had a need. And that need was God. And Daniel knew that I offer something of the king that he doesn't have. Something that every person who's ever lived needs, which is a relationship with God in this life, a relationship with God to have eternal life. And the same is true today. Every person you've ever met, and you probably have never thought about it this way before, but every person needs God. They may not even realize their need for God, but the greatest hole that exists inside of every human heart is a hole that only God can fill. Your boss at work today, as much of a jerk as he is, is in need of God. Your parents, and however great or poorly you think of them, are in need of a relationship with God. Billionaires, supermodels, baristas, all come into existence and have and share in common a need 
for God in this life and for eternal life. There's an emptiness that ultimately only God can satisfy. Tom Brady, a couple weeks ago, decided that he was going to do another fake out and come back to play again for the 700th year. And you think about that. And my wife and I were talking about it, and who knows? It's like, man, you just can't let it go. And the reasons behind that, you know, who knows? I do know he did an interview a handful of years ago, and it was with 60 Minutes. And the interview may give us the reason why it's hard to let it go. In the interview, he says this. It's Tom Brady speaking. There's times I'm not the person I want to be. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is it. I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. And the interviewer asked him, what's the answer? And what he responds with is tragic. What's the answer? Tom Brady responds, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Now, what's he reflecting? He's reflecting what's true about every person you've ever met and never will meet, that there is a hole inside of the human heart. God says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that he put it there so that you and I would encounter him, that everyone has a need for God. And some of you came to the room tonight, and you don't think you need God. You feel like you're living your life. You got everything on the outside looks picturesque. Everything looks like what everyone else would want. And yet you know it's empty. And you'll either discover that today or discover your need eventually because every person has a desperate need inside of the human heart for God. Just like the king had a desperate need for an answer from the divine. And Daniel is able to go confidently because he knows that I offer and I have something that every person needs and he doesn't have. It was a writer for the London Times, which is basically the New York Times version of the Times, it's actually called in London. And he was reflecting on some time that he'd spent in Africa. And he says something, despite being an atheist, that really reflects what's true, not just of Africa, but of all places in general. Here's what it says. This is Matthew Paris for the London Times. And he writes about what he observed in his time in Malawi. He says, as an atheist, I truly believe Africa needs God. This confounds my ideological belief, stubbornly refuses to fit in my worldview, and has embarrassed my growing belief that there is no God. Though I'm an atheist, I'm convinced of the enormous contribution Christian evangelism or the body of Christ or the message of Jesus makes in Africa, distinct from all the other works of government projects, secular NGOs, international aid. These alone will not do. It then says, in Africa, Christianity changes people's lives hearts. And the change is good. Christians, black and white, working in Africa, do heal the sick, do teach people to read and write. Only the severest kind of secularist could see a mission, hospital, or school and say the world would be better off without that. Missionaries, I love it, not aid money, are the solution to Africa's biggest problem. Removing Christian evangelism from African equation may leave the continent at the mercy of a malign fusion of Nike, the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. That even an atheist looks and says, man, I've got to confess, these people need God. Where he gets it wrong is he says, Africa. What's true is he needs God. All people need God. In every place and in every space. Dallas, Boise, Scottsdale, is filled with people who need God. And Daniel has a confidence that comes from man. I bring to the table something that every person needs because I know my creator. The second thing we see in the story, and I think is unbelievably profound, is the prediction that he now makes. The interpretation of the king's dream. He goes, basically, and he goes and prays. And that night, it says, verse 19, God revealed the vision to Daniel. God... Daniel then praised God and said, praise the name of God forever and ever. 
He has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of human events or world events. Our God removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things. He knows what lies hidden in darkness, though he's surrounded by light. I thank you and praise you, God of my ancestors. Daniel prays. He then goes back and says, hey, take me to the king. I will tell him the interpretation. Shows up at the king, and the king says, do you know what it means? Do you know my dream? Do you know the interpretation? And this is how Daniel responds. Verse 27, Daniel replied, there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell of your dream and the visions that you had. That he says, nobody can tell this, but there is a God in heaven. And he has told you what is going to happen in the centuries to follow and for the rest of human history. And here is your dream, king. And then he says, and this is the point where, if your mind works like mine, inside of watching the movie of this happen, this is when the suspenseful music turns on and the king leans forward in his throne as he hears Daniel describe exactly what you dreamed. He says, in your vision, your majesty, you saw before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were of silver, its belly and thighs were of bronze, its legs were iron, and its feet were a combination of iron and clay. As you watched this statue in front of you, all of a sudden a rock cut from a mountain, not made by human hands, struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing it to bits. The whole statue crushed into small pieces of clay, iron, gold, and bronze. Then the wind blew away all of them without a trace, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked down the statue became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. He says, you saw, and there was a statue, and the head was made of something, and the arms were made of silver, and then the chest and the thighs were made of bronze, and the legs were made of iron, and then this rock comes out of nowhere, and it hits the feet of the statue, and the entire thing crumbles and collapses. And the king is realizing that's exactly what I saw. And then Daniel says, and here's the meaning of your dream. This is what he says, verse 36. Now we will tell you what it means. Your majesty, you are the king of kings, or the greatest of kings. God has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. He made you the ruler over all of the inhabited world. You're the ruler of the known world. You and your kingdom is the head of gold. So the first empire that we're told of is the Babylonian, the head of gold, if you will, the statue, a replica, a remake of it is right there. And he sees this image and the head is gold. And the reason Babylon would have been gold is, like I said earlier, the amount of gold people didn't even know existed in the entire world, that the city was filled with it. And then he says, but there's another kingdom. Verse 37, 39. But after your kingdom, in other words, your kingdom will come to an end. Another kingdom inferior to yours will rise and take your place. The two arms are made out of silver, and the silver kingdom is the Medo-Persian kingdom. It was these two groups that combined, Medes and the Persians, that eventually, 100 years later, or no, 50 years later, would conquer Babylon. And it's represented by these two arms coming together, and it will take down your kingdom. And then he says, and then there's another kingdom that's coming. Verse 30, 40. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom represented by bronze will rise to rule the world. So he says there's the gold kingdom. Then there's going to be another kingdom that takes you down. Then there's going to be a kingdom after you. 
which would be the kingdom of Greece. Why would it be the kingdom of bronze? Well, the Greek kingdom, again, none of this has happened. Daniel's saying this is what's about to happen in the next few centuries. The bronze kingdom was led by a guy named Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great mastered, perfected, had his soldiers perfect the use of bronze and weaponry. And so it was the bronze kingdom. Alexander the Great would conquer the known world from Egypt to India by the age of 33. And he would conquer and come in and be the third kingdom represented here. What's interesting is 200 years later when Alexander was conquering the world and establishing his kingdom, he comes outside of Jerusalem and he's about to take on Israel. And the high priest goes outside of the city and brings with him the book of Daniel and says, don't kill us. We saw you coming. Our God told us that you were here and that you would conquer. And, Dan, and Alexander the Great is so flattered that his name would be, or his kingdom would be written and prophesied about in here and in chapter seven, that he doesn't destroy the city and he moves forward. And yet after this kingdom, we're told of another one that would raise up, where Daniel says, following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one. It will be strong as iron. And that kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires, just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. So there's gonna be an even stronger kingdom. Iron was known as the strongest metal at the time. And this kingdom would be represented by Rome. It would be stronger than all the others, and Rome, established a military might unlike anything the world had ever seen. And they ruled for hundreds of years. All of this is written 600 years before any of that would ever happen. And Daniel's saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, God has told you what is going to happen. Now before we go to the next point and discover why he was so terrified at that reality, I just wanna camp on something and the second observation, everything is under God's control. Everyone needs God, and everything is under God's control. I want you to think about what Daniel just said. We often think that, man, where is God, and how could this be happening? And Daniel just said, there's going to be an empire set up by Alexander the Great, who is anything but a worshiper of God, and God's going to be sovereignly over him ruling. There's going to be an empire set up by the Persians. Remember Xerxes, and they're going to basically invent crucifixion, and they're going to be a wicked-filled people, but God is going to allow their empire to be established. God is going to allow the Roman Empire to be established, that God is in control of everything, and these men sit and they think that they're in control. They are pawns in the story God is writing, and he will use Anyone and everyone and everything because everything is underneath God's control. Daniel even highlights this in verse 21 where he says, he controls the course of world events. He removes kings and he sets up other kings. That he is sovereign and in control over what is happening in Ukraine, over what's happening in Dallas, what's happening in Russia, what happened in Iran, that God is sovereign and in control over all of it. And the scripture tells us that as believers, we have a promise from God that he is using and will use everything in this life to bring about good for those who love him. Romans chapter eight, verse 28 says that God works all things together for good for the people of God or for those who love him. And make no mistake, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are not in control but there is one who is. My wife, in this season, because we have a newborn, often will send me and I'll take the kids and we'll go shopping because there's some age where it's like until 12 weeks and they have shots, you're basically kind of like on lockdown with the baby. And so she'll hang at home with them and I'll take the other two kids and we'll go out shopping, which is honestly one of the most exhausting things of all time because you walk into a store and you got two little kids and they're just going crazy running around and you're trying to just you know walk the walk of shame as people look at you like what kind of parent are you right there they don't even have clothes on and they're running around going like hey can we get a toy can we get a toy can we and I'm like we're at the gas station they don't have toys at the gas station and that's just what they think anytime that they go shopping anywhere they're going to get a toy and and so it's just madness and sometimes I honestly just give them a toy just stop just stop take the toy 
There's one exception to shopping that, honestly, it focuses all of their energy and distracts them with enough time that it makes it a little bit more enjoyable, and that's when you go to a shopping center that has a shopping cart with a car on it. It looks something like this. Why is that important? Because they get in the cart and they think that they're driving the cart. And so they're like, yes, we're going this way and yes, we're going this way. And they're taking turns and they're going around and you know, we're going through and getting the list of things mom said we gotta go get. Inevitably, while we're driving, there comes a point where they wanna take another lap around the store and I need to go get a light bulb or go get something else and they turn right and I turn left. And they discover, wait a second. <laughs> I'm not driving this thing at all. And they may throw a fit, they may freak out, they may react, but they become very aware who's driving the cart. And the message of the Bible and what Daniel is depicting is that don't buy the lie that you're driving the cart. But there is a God in heaven who is actively involved in the events and the circumstances of the world around you, and he is in control. And there is nothing that you or I will ever face that he is not sovereignly over, that he is not in power over, that he will not use to bring about good from, for the people of God, because he's in control. And this should move us to do a couple of things that I think Daniel models. One of them is Daniel is faced with a problem, and what does he do? He immediately moves to pray, because he knew my God controls everything. He controls kings' hearts, he controls everything that is, so I'm gonna go to him in prayer. How often, when problems hit, do you not turn, do I not turn to God and ask him for help? God, I, you know what I'm walking through right now at work, and you know what I'm concerned about as it relates to this presentation or my boss's opinion of me, and we don't, Ask God for help. Like Daniel models just what a, a belief and a death grip on, my God is in control of everything. And so I can ask him because he can change and do anything. And it moves him to go to God in prayer. The second thing that we see modeled out from him is that it moves him to trust. That even, I mean, Daniel is sitting in the palace 600 miles away from his home. He had every reason to believe God has forgotten me. God is up to nothing. I'm about to get killed by this crazy king if I can't tell him his dream. And yet he believed God is still in control. He can answer my prayer. And I'm gonna choose to trust him. What's astounding about the predictions is think about it. All of these would come to pass. And Daniel lays out, these are the only empires that will ever exist. And to this day, he's been correct. I mean, March Madness is going on right now. And in the history of March Madness, not one person has ever predicted successfully a bracket. Not one. And he lays out and predicts every world empire that will ever be and gets them exactly right. Because he knew the God who controls everything. Finally, final observation that we see is that every kingdom but God's won't last. It says this, the feet and the toes you saw were a combination of iron and clay, showing this kingdom, this next kingdom, will be divided like iron mixed with clay. It will have some strength of iron, but while some parts of it will be as strong as iron, other will be as weak as clay. And the mixture of iron and clay shows that these kingdoms will strengthen themselves by forming alliances through intermarriage, but they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix. What is he saying right there? This is one of those that the interpretation is divided. It's either referring to what happened after Rome, which was Europe, and that there would be kingdoms that would rise up, but no super kingdom would ever quite dominate all of that area. And they would have marriages where Henry V would marry some French lady and they'd try to hold and build a stronger kingdom, but it wouldn't last. Or he's referring to a kingdom that will rise up at the very end, made up of 10 kings like the 10 toes and the feet that Revelation points to. 
Either way, it's Daniel reflecting, hey, there was not going to be another superpower like these that will rule, expand, and conquer all of the world. But during the reign of those kings, verse 44, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness. It will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain. Though not by human hands, that crushed to pieces the statue, the great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true and its meaning is certain. Nebuchadnezzar hears it, knows it, falls, we're told, verse 46, at Daniel's feet and he worshiped him, commanded sacrifices be made, and then he said to Daniel, truly your God is the greatest of all gods, the Lord over kings, revealer of mysteries, you have revealed the secret. And he gives Daniel a promotion, puts him in charge of all the wise men. The final thing we see is that every kingdom but God's won't last. This is why Nebuchadnezzar was terrified. And candidly, this is why a lot of people, when they think about the end of their life, become terrified. Nebuchadnezzar is confronted with the fact that, hey, there's gonna come another kingdom that's going to destroy yours. Yours is not gonna last. In fact, every human kingdom will be ultimately destroyed, and it filled him with terror. That I've built my entire life trying to build walls of security, trying to build a name for myself. And Daniel is saying, your kingdom will not last. Well, you have given all of your strength and years of life too will be blown away like a sandcastle when the tide comes in and you will have wasted your life, O king, because every kingdom but God's won't last. The same instruction is applicable to us today. And knowing that God's kingdom alone will last, it will do two things. It will either create hope when you hear that, that, man, I've given my life to the only thing that eternally is going to matter, or horror when your life is done. Because you will realize you have wasted and you have given yourself to something that will not last and wasted your life. And the king felt horror as he looked at the coming kingdom of God. The other thing that we see is the stone, which is Daniel in his picture of Jesus. Notice it said, a stone not cut by human hands. What does that mean? It was a stone that was divinely created. It wasn't cut from the mountain by any human work. It was a stone that had not been formed by human hands. And it's going to come down and it's going to crush every kingdom that exists that Jesus will establish a kingdom and every other kingdom in this world and every leading nation and empire will be crushed underneath the wonder of the everlasting kingdom Jesus is going to create. And Daniel says, it's true, it's sure, it's coming. Our God is establishing a kingdom that will never fade and every kingdom but God's won't last. As it's been said, history, and the point of all of human history is that it is his story, our God's. And Daniel is given a spoiler alert to Nebuchadnezzar, you are gonna waste your life, and you will waste your life if you spend it trying to build and amass your kingdom and focused on you getting the house and getting the car and getting the raise and making a million by 30, all of which are great, and I hope that you do. But if that is the focal point of your life, you are building a kingdom that will not last. And the scriptures teach us the way that we live for an eternal kingdom starts with living with an eternal mindset. What do I mean by that? You, know, you read the New Testament, you see verses like, hey, set your mind on things above. Colossians chapter three, verse two says. Or in 2 Corinthians chapter four, it says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal, and that's where we fix our focus. And that leads to living from an eternal mindset. And the scriptures say that when it comes to how you think about your life, the way that you and I live for a kingdom that actually will last is we begin to think through the lens of eternity. What does that mean? It means your job. You don't see yourself just there to work and get a paycheck. You see yourself there as someone to promote 
the name of Jesus, to share the gospel with people around you, to speak when somebody brings up how they're walking through a hard time and they really are facing challenges, you're a voice that's there that says, can I tell you where I turn when things are hard? Can I, can I just share what I feel like God has been really growing in me lately? And you see it as an eternal opportunity as Titus chapter two, chapter two says, to promote in everything the teachings of our Savior. It means when you, it comes to thinking of a spouse, you think through the lens of eternity, that you're not just looking for somebody who's hot or not, or somebody that has some sort of body type. I'm looking for someone who has an eternal mindset because no human relationship is gonna impact this life or my eternal life and how I use this life like my spouse. So I'm looking for somebody who wants to lock arms as we raise disciples, make babies, and live for eternity. It looks like when it comes to your time, you don't think, oh, my 20s, these are my years to spend on you, to sow my wild oats. It looks like I wanna live for Jesus and my generation, and I'm gonna use the life, the gifts, the time that he has given me to do what Ecclesiastes 12 says, and I'm gonna remember my creator in my youth because I'm gonna build in the only kingdom that will last. And Daniel has a confidence because he says, you king, You've been building a kingdom that's gonna crumble. And God is telling you the human history. He doesn't tell anybody else this specific of a narrative of what is to come. Because God wants you to repent. God's pursuing you, Nebuchadnezzar. He wants you to know you don't have to give your life to building your kingdom. And you can know the God of heaven. And you can be a part of building his or you will be crushed by it. And Daniel models living and embracing, I'm gonna have a mindset that flows from my relationship with my God. And the inside of my wedding ring, my wife had written 2 Corinthians chapter five, verse 14 and 15, where it talks about Paul's description of how we now see this life as those of us who are believers and that we live for the only kingdom that lasts. He says in verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter five, Christ's love compels us, for we are convinced that one died for all, that's Jesus, and therefore all died, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We, therefore, verse 20, are Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. There's a story this week that I read of a missionary named James Calvert. He was a missionary to the Fiji Islands in the mid-1800s. And when you think of Fiji, you probably think like I do, of just, you know, huts over the water that have, like, glass. It's like, that's a pretty sweet gig to be a missionary to, but... Fiji in the 1850s was very different. And the island had native tribes that were there that were cannibals. And James Calvert felt called to go and share the message of Jesus with these men. And so he took a group with him and they were going there to share the gospel and they get on the boat and they ride over and they arrive at Fiji and the captain of the boat says, you can't stay here. If you stay here, you will die and all of the men with you will die. And James Calvert responds and says, we died before we came here. In Christ, we died to ambition, selfish goals, our own dreams. We died to self and everything that self desires. We died that Christ may live in and through us, that whatever we attempt within his call of God brings him glory. We died before we came here so that there be no hindrance, no barriers within ourselves to follow Christ in the areas of the world where there is a great darkness and a yearning for the light. What is he saying? He's saying, I've already died to living for myself. I'm not here for that purpose. I'm here to build the only kingdom that matters and that will last. In conclusion, everyone needs God. Everything is under God's control and every kingdom with God or other than God's will fade. Now there's one last prediction that I didn't highlight 
that you see has happened. And it's prediction that he had in verse 34 and 35. I'm going to read it again. Daniel's saying, here's what you saw. You saw the statue, and then you saw this rock, and it came out of the heavens, and it smashed every earthly kingdom. And then that stone grew and became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. What is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the message of Jesus. And this is another one of the prophecies that we have seen happen with the message of Christianity, the message of Jesus, which is what? In case you're curious, it's that God came into the world in the form of Christ, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, and he died on a cross for you, for me, for anyone who's ever sinned, which is everyone. And he gave his life as the payment for your sin. And anyone who believes in him and accepts his death and resurrection as payment for their mistakes they've made, the sin in their life, they will live forever, the Bible says. And that message has exploded past the walls of the empire it was formed in and spread all over the earth, and that stone has become a great mountain covering the whole earth. What do I mean by that? People think of Christianity as something that's in the West or it's something in America. Christianity is exploding all over the world. You look at Latin America. You look at Asia, America, and the countries that are exploding with Christianity far outnumber even today. In fact, the fastest places the gospel is growing today is Africa, Asia, and and Latin America. Two-thirds of all self-identifying Christians today live in Africa, Asia, or Latin America. To say Christianity is just something for white people in the West or something for Americans or something for, is crazy and lives in denial of what is actually true. The fact that the gospel is exploding all over Africa today. There are more practicing Christians in Africa than all of Europe combined. There are more Anglicans, which is the Church of England, in Africa than there are in England. There are more Presbyterian, which is the Church of Scotland, inside of Ghana than there are in Scotland. There are more Christian scholars say today in China than all of America. And by 2050, it is estimated that the population of China will be a majority Christian nation in a country where it is outlawed. The message of Jesus is exploding because our God said it would be a message that would be a stone that will eventually topple all earthly kingdoms and it will spread and be a mountain covering the whole earth. Don't buy the lie that Christianity is in any form on its way out because our God is a rock of salvation to those who trust in him and a rock that will not be stopped and a force that is growing all over through the same God that worked through Daniel. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that you are at work all over our world, and there are brothers and sisters right now that are praying in every language of every socioeconomic status, of every skin color, every nationality, and hundreds of languages, and they're crying out and praying to the same God that Daniel prayed to, that gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream. I pray that you would prevent this generation, ourselves, from living for a kingdom that will not last. I pray that anyone who's never put their faith in that message that is spreading and filling the whole earth of our God who came to save, tonight would be their night. We worship you in song.